Well, will he or won't he? Considerable speculation has developed within the political world with regard to the governor of New Jersey, Chris Christie. Will he run for president or not? People are impressed by his uh, strong demeanor, uh, his uh, ability to uh, work with a democratic uh, house and yet to effect change, to reduce uh, considerable spending burdens that were on the state of New Jersey and to produce a considerable uh, reform of the government. In an interview, however, with uh, Neil Cavuto, the business consultant for Fox News uh, a year ago, in June of 2010, Mr. Cavuto asked Mr. Christie if he would run for president. And he said in rather uncertain terms that he had no desire to serve as president. There's simply no way that he would run. He did not feel that he was well suited for the task. He was not prepared for it. And he had no desire. The office of president would impose upon him and his family all kinds of sacrifices that he was not prepared to make. He enjoyed his life. He was challenged by his current office as governor and so he would not change. In fact, so adamant has been his uh, denials of any, of any interest in serving in the office of president, he said, what more can I do to persuade you that I'm not interested in running than by committing suicide? <laughs> it's just, it was not going to happen. Well, he's under considerable pressure now to reconsider those words and we'll see how he stands up to the pressure. One thing about those who serve in church office is that they should have a desire to hold that office. They should have a strong gut feeling that they are called to that office from the Lord, that they are equipped for that office, and they have a desire, a strong desire to serve the church of the Lord Jesus in that fashion. The Apostle Paul, who after his uh, efforts at planting churches was uh, put in place, uh, would return to these churches and uh, years later to uh, install elders within each church, uh, gave Timothy some advice with regard to what he should do in the city of Ephesus in terms of uh, uh, organizing the church there and having elders serve in the church there. In his pastoral letters to Timothy and Titus, Paul gives a lot of advice and counsel with regard to who should serve in the office of elder and what is the nature of that office. Uh, in 1 Timothy chapter 3, from which we read from earlier, the Apostle Paul speaks of this office in terms of an overseer. Uh, in Greek, the word is episkopos, from which you can hear the word episcopal, uh, one who looks over. Episkopos, if you break that down, epi, epi looking over, skopos, uh, scope, microscope, telescope. So there are ones that look over the flock. There are overseers. Uh, in some respects, I think it's rooted in the, the great image of the old covenant of the shepherd watching over his flock. Uh, the elders of the old covenant were considered as shepherds and they tended the flock that the Lord entrusted to their care. They were judged when they uh, did not care for that flock appropriately, when they neglected or abandoned the flock, and they were also encouraged when they were faithful. In the Old Covenant, we see that there's a promise of a new shepherd who would come, one who would rise up to shepherd the flock of God, who would be faithful, and he himself would uh, place within his church faithful shepherds who would tend to the needs of his flock. We read earlier from the 23rd Psalm where David, who grew up raising flocks, said, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not be in want. And David immediately puts our eyes upon the Lord himself, who is our shepherd, who watches over his flock and cares for our needs. He is our great overseer. Of course, when Jesus uh, begins his ministry, one of the things that he says to his church in the course of his ministry is that he is the good shepherd, the one who lays down his life for his sheep. But as the good shepherd who is now risen and sits enthroned in heaven, he uh, raises up men to serve in the office of elder shepherds. Uh, in Paul's letter to the church at Ephesus in the fourth chapter, he speaks of 
those whom Christ has given to the church, apostles and prophets, pastors. Uh, that word pastor is again related to one who cares for a flock, a shepherd. And it's not specifically, although it has certainly a connection with those who occupy the office of a teaching elder within the church, but it has regard to all those who serve in the office of elder. They are shepherds. They are pastors who care for the flock entrusted to them. In fact, Paul makes use of a variety of terms to describe those who would hold this office, overseer, uh, which we see here. The King James uh, translation uh, uses the word bishop. Uh, that's rooted in the Old English biscopus, episcopus, which you can hear the Latin and also the Greek, again, scopos, uh, one who looks over. Bishop. So if you consider electing elders within your church, it might be appropriate to call them your bishop. But in our modern age, that uh, term has described a form of church government, an Episcopal church government, or even a Roman Catholic church government, where it describes someone who has a higher office over a region of churches or over uh, pastors or priests and so forth underneath them. Single individuals who occupy rule and authority within the church. And that is a fundamental misunderstanding of the role that Paul presents to us here. The bishop within the church is synonymous with the elder within the church. That's another Greek word that Paul uses, presbyteros. The presbyter, or the elder, one who uh, is dignified in his uh, manner, demeanor. Uh, one who is mature in his faith. In fact, if you go to Paul's letter to Titus in the first chapter, you find that Paul uses both words synonymously to describe the same office. They are presbyters and bishops, elders, overseers, who have rule and charge over the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Paul says to uh, Titus and to Timothy as well that he, they are responsible for uh, appointing elders in each church. So there would be a plurality of elders who serve, and not really one individual uh, to whom all with, with whom all authority resides. One of the marks of a Presbyterian form of government is that it makes use of a plurality of elders rather than one single office holder holding sway over the church. We do not appoint the pastor to be the head and superintendent of the church. And elders underneath him, or deacons underneath him. The pastor is one among many within the office of the session. He is an elder within the church. Now, there are distinctions within the eldership. Some have a strong emphasis in the area of ruling, governing, managing the church. Others will focus more specifically on teaching. But they hold the same office, the office of elder. Ruling elders, teaching elders, they're all elders. So there's a plurality within the office of elder. This protects the church from the dominance of one particular individual or from uh, the, the limits of any one individual's understanding of circumstances and situations in life. A plurality provides the opportunity for different elders to interact with one another and to mutually inform each other and to arrive at hopefully more sensible, balanced Judgments and decisions within the life of the church. We are Presbyterians, and so we hold to a plurality of offices. As Presbyterians as well, we do not confine those offices merely to the local church. When you appoint someone to serve in your church as an elder, his responsibility will first of all be for the local congregation, but he also has responsibility for those beyond the local church. He will serve in broader terms in the regional, national, maybe even into international bodies of service. For it's the one church of the Lord Jesus Christ to which he's called to hold office. And there are different le levels of government within that church. In the church in which Paul was writing, the church at Antioch held a prominent role within the Gentile churches. Paul's uh, missionary journeys originated from that church, and then when he completed his missionary journeys, he came back to Antioch and reported to them what had taken place. 
When a dispute arose within Antioch that they could not settle, they went from Antioch to Jerusalem and there had the, the problem settled. There were higher courts of the church to which appeals could be made so that just decisions could be provided for the church. Christ provides higher levels of church government so that the church would be protected and preserved. So, Paul says it is a, a trustworthy saying that if anyone aspires for the office of elder, he desires a noble task. It's a trustworthy saying. It's like Paul has been collecting a variety of sayings and he holds them dear to himself. Perhaps these sayings have been repeated in the church from time to time. He says, this one's a good one. I want you to pay attention to it. Think about it. Some people are worried if a man has a desire to serve in office, perhaps that's not the way it should be. Perhaps he should be dragged kicking and screaming into office by the man of his people. Not so, Paul says. He should have that desire. It's not a, a, a kind of selfish ambition. It should be a selfish ambition. It should be the desire to serve the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that desire is noble and should be cultivated. In fact, those who serve in office already should look for young men who have that desire within them and try to cultivate them and lead them along the way so that they would be prepared and trained and ready to serve in that office should the Lord call them to that. So it's a trustworthy saying. It's a good thing to desire to serve as an elder. Perhaps not all who desire that office will actually be placed in office. There is the need for the church to evaluate their gifts, to examine them, and to see if this one is worthy to hold that office. And what you will find here is that Paul gives Timothy and to the churches at large a description for the kinds of things they ought to be looking for in those who would be candidates for the office of elder. There are certain things we should look for and certain things we should avoid. And some men who might appear as very presentable within the church, within the community, perhaps they are respectable in the community, they're successful in business, they have a good family life and so forth. You might think that maybe they should serve in the church as well. But that's not necessarily so. Office in the church is a spiritual office under the submission to the Lord Jesus Christ. And Paul gives us the kinds of qualities that we ought to look for in those who would serve and they must, Paul says, have these qualities. He begins with a rather intimidating <laughs> uh, assertion of what we should be looking for. They must be above reproach. And the King James makes it even more intimidating. They must be blameless. Now, that's rather strong. I think any of us who look at themselves in the mirror can say, I'm not exactly blameless. I'm not perfect in any way. I very much know my sins, my faults, my shortcomings. So does this description right away prohibit anyone really from entering the office because who among us is blameless? Who is entirely above reproach? Well, clearly Paul does not have, have in mind here anyone who is perfect because in this life we do not attain to perfection. Even your elders, your pastor, fall into sin. That's me. We fall into sin. But we should not fall into great scandalous sins. There should not be major significant flaws in one's life, particularly in the way that is described here as Paul goes on uh, through the course of this text. There should be a certain integrity to the way in which they conduct themselves. A certain respectability about them. And so Paul uh, calls our attention to the personal qualities that ought to be evident within their lives. And he has quite a list of, of qualities that he, he puts before us. Among those qualities which I would describe as being above, reflecting one who is above reproach, he says they are to be self-controlled. They ought to have a sound mind, more literally. Uh, they ought to be uh, able to evaluate things in a careful, objective way and not be governed by passions and feelings, swayed from one position to the next. Um, they ought to be respectable. In uh, the Greek, it's 
a word that derives from the word cosmos, or the world, order. So they should have orderly lives. You should look at them and say that their lives are pretty well uh, structured. They may not necessarily have their lives dictated by a daytimer and they have everything scheduled out, but they should have a fairly a well-ordered lives and you can depend on them. If they're going to say that they're going to be someplace at a certain time, generally that's where they're going to be. They're respectable in that uh, way. They're hospitable. Uh, the Greek here has the idea of being a friend to strangers. They are willing to open themselves up in their homes to those who are new, particularly Christians. In, in, in Paul's day, Christians would travel from one community to the next. And rather than staying in the hotels, which were rather seedy, uh, corrupt, uh, they would seek out Christian homes where they could stay. And it should be the part of an elder to welcome people into home. Here in the church, we should see that these are men who welcome people, the stranger, into the church. They should look for those who are new and seek them out and try to include them within, within the life of the church, like Barnabas seeking out Saul long ago and bringing them into the life of the church. They're hospitable. 